Well, good evening. Welcome. Glad you're here. Uh, ready for a good study tonight? And uh, here's the great thing is that we, we had all that time away and we're back. And we've had two sessions and next Wednesday is the first Wednesday of the month. So we'll be off. <laughs> Not getting any momentum, are we? But uh, remember, the first Sunday of the month, kind of a Sabbath Wednesday, we will not meet, but we'll get right back into it the following Wednesday night. Sound good? All right, let's pray together. We pause, Holy Spirit, asking you to be our guide and our teacher. Enlighten our minds, lead us into truth. And more than anything, may the truth that we learn make us more like you so that we can be a light to this world. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's go. I've got, got a couple of things to deal with tonight because we, we had a question that came in and then I, I forgot this, that Sunday morning when I showed uh, a neat picture of my grandson, <laughs> uh, this was the end of this little video that I showed you uh, Sunday morning. And uh, this is grandson number three, and uh, he'll be three uh, next month, and uh, he wants to be Spider-Man. And what child about this age doesn't want to be a superhero? I wanted to be Batman uh, when I was a kid, so we, I mean, he, it's just, listen, what I said Sunday is this, if you notice that you do not have to teach a child to want to be like the superhero you never have to set a child down and go now listen you should want to be like spider-man he flies over the place and he defeats his enemies and it's cool and it's fun you don't have to do that you don't have to have any lessons like that on why you should want to be like spider-man all you have to do is show him spider-man show him take him to the movie Show them Spider-Man, Superman, Batman, Marvel movies, whatever 139 different characters there are. You show them one of them, and they want to be like them. And I, I wrote this a little bit today on, on my Facebook page that um, the Bible says, Be holy as I am holy. That verse used to scare the bejeebies out of me. I hated it. I hated that verse because I couldn't do it. And it was almost like a, listen, you're, you can't be holy, so there's times you just want to give up because God's demanding that we be holy. Holy. Perfect. How you doing? And so that, that kind of teaching, it left me... Um, so exhausted from trying to keep the rules because if I had to be holy like he's holy in order to earn his favor I am never having his favor because I never can get it all right and that is the curse of religion that's kind of what religion gets us to do but here's what I've discovered that when God says be holy because, I, uh, because I'm holy it's not a demand it's an invitation what God is saying is, I want you to enter into a relationship with me. You will see what I'm like, and I won't have to teach you to want to be like me. You'll want to be like me. Because what is God like? I've taught this to you now over the last five years. God is like Jesus. God's like Jesus. What do you think of Jesus? Jesus. Pretty cool? Did you take Jesus over Superman? The ultimate superhero. You and I enter into a relationship with Jesus, we'll want to be like him. You see, I, and that's why it is so important that the body of Christ portray God as he really is. He'll draw. The problem is oftentimes our image of God is distorted because what we believe about God is not true. And if I told you why, it's Wednesday night. I get to tell you why. 
because you're drawing what we've done is we've drawn all of our ideas about God from many Old Testament passages he's slaughtering people in the Old Testament he's pretty ticked off a lot of times now a lot of times he's loving but it's a lot of times he's not what if I told you that every passage in the Bible must kneel to Jesus? Because Jesus is what the Bible's about. You search the scriptures, Jesus said to the Pharisees, thinking they will lead you to life, but the scriptures point you to what? Me, Jesus said. All of scriptures, the whole story is pointing to Jesus. So if we really want to know what God's like, God's like Jesus. Jesus. that is incredible news and yet individuals the evil one has done a great job of just mixing our minds up so we really don't know and we don't understand and people are like I don't want to go to church I don't want to know this I don't want to God does this and he's like this and he's like this oh we need to recapture the early vision that the early Christian and church fathers had of God by the way, if you don't want to be like God, your picture is distorted. Now, we have, we have to really ask ourselves, do we really want to be like God? By the way, Jesus described what God's like in the Sermon on the Mount. He ended up one portion of it, and he said this, be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. You say, well, what's perfect look like? Read what Jesus just said. Love your enemy. By the way, if Jesus says love your enemies, and God is one who loves his enemies then why is he torture him in hell forever? Why does he get to torture his enemies and I have to love mine? I'm just asking the question. Just ask the question. So, that is first off topic. We're doing two today. This question, and I, I sent out a little video with this kind of a tease. Um, Linda, are you here? There you go, okay. Um, Auschwitz display down at Union Station. Uh, I was uh, you know, in uh, Jerusalem and went to the Holocaust um, Museum. And uh, I'll never forget it. It just is incredible. It's this one of the saddest. In, in one place, you're standing there on a huge glass, and it's just shoes everywhere of little children who were put in the ovens. Soldiers. I don't know, anybody ever watched Schindler's List? Uh, It's difficult. It's difficult to watch. Especially the little colored, it's black and white and the little red dress, if you remember some of that from Schindler's List. So uh, Linda asked the question, it's hard to imagine that those who participate in such horrific crimes against humanity, how could they be accepted into heaven someday? And I think it's a legit question, don't you? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I showed you, uh, probably ought to get a little Titus off there while we're talking about this. Um, I showed you a video from the movie called Changeling. Do you remember that? Angelina Jolie played the, the, uh, the individual whose, whose son was kidnapped. And I showed the video here, and, and uh, when she met the, the individual who did it, who wouldn't confess it, do you remember what she said to him over and over again? I hope you go to hell, I hope you go to hell, I hope you go to hell, I hope you go to hell. And who can blame her? Who can blame her? So for some, I said, the idea of ultimate reconciliation is not really that great a news. Because we we have an idea that certain individuals deserve hell. But let me ask this question. So I think this is a great question because to be honest with you, one of the reasons, uh, Linda, I, I chose to do this and spend some time on it is because this question gets asked all the time. It's usually in regard to Hitler. What about Hitler? Um, so let me just ask this question. Let's do some thinking. Okay, you ready? I, want you, I don't want you to answer out loud. I just want you to, to, to do some thinking. Here's the answer. Is there a sin or sins so bad that one couldn't be saved if they committed. We'll answer the unpardonable sin, so separate that from this for a moment, okay? But is there a sin or an accumulation of sins 
that at some point a person who accumulated so many sins couldn't be saved okay for the traditional view of uh, afterlife which would be eternal conscious torment in hell those individuals believe that if you pray the prayer before you die you don't have to suffer anything right okay so what is sincere how do you measure sincerity who measures sincerity so I would agree that there has to be sincerity involved but let me go to this okay Ted Bundy how many of you know read he claimed to pray the prayer in prison I guess he doesn't have to suffer anything for what he did according to the traditional view right not this view not this view the traditional view says he prayed the prayer the person who lived a really moral life but didn't pray the prayer they're going to be tortured forever in hell but Bundy's good Jeffrey Dahmer read do you remember what Jeffrey Dahmer did? He claimed in prison that he found Jesus. So according to the traditional view, the majority view, the majority evangelical view, Jeffrey Dahmer doesn't have to pay for anything. Sure, sure. So the, the, the rule is, all you have to do is sincerely confess Jesus, pray, and you go to heaven. So, is it possible that, we've, we've raised this issue, is it possible, by the way, this is what we do here, so these are, we're, we're diving in, okay? post mortem opportunity after death opportunity is there an opportunity to trust Jesus after death and it could it happen for those that we're talking about now uh, so is it possible that somebody who participated in such things could they choose to follow Jesus after death and I give you once again my challenge Show me one verse, just one, that clearly says that once you die, there's no more opportunity. Just show me one. Not five, not ten. One. One. Yet, it's like a solid doctrine in the church that that couldn't happen. Once you die, that's it. Suppose any man wants to die after this, the judgment. I agree with that. But what's the judgment? Let's talk. Not right now. Because we're talking about something else. Okay, here's what I want to show you. And I didn't put it on the screen. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew chapter 10. If not, I'll read this to you. I find this really interesting. And I thought of this as not too long before I came out. So it's not up on your screen. So many of you are going to be familiar with this verse when I read it to you. Jesus is speaking. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one, one being caps in my NIV version reading here. So that would be God who can destroy both soul and body. And this NIV translation says in hell. Now, the word is Gehenna. Translated hell here. Once again, the word H-E-L-L, hell, does not appear anywhere in the Bible. It's translated English hell, but it is Hades, Gehenna, and Tartarus used once, mostly Hades and Gehenna. So, but destroy the body and so in hell. How many of you think that verse is a little ominous? Usually a verse used against those who are 
teaching what I'm teaching. But the word soul is a Greek, again, a New Testament written in Greek, so I don't, I'm not even going to try to pronounce this, but P-S-C-H-U-E, P-S-U-C-H-E. That's the word translated soul. It's used in other places as well. You can look it up. It means life, mind, and heart. So in Gehenna, there is a destruction, Jesus says, potentially of the soul. What does that mean? We think that's just eternal conscious torment. That's where our minds um, automatically go. But what Jesus, I say, suggests to you that he is saying is, is that in a future judgment, God will can destroy your heart, mind, life, your goals, your desires, your purposes in life. His consuming fire will burn those away if they're not in line with his image. And I would suggest to you it'd be rather painful. So, no one is suggesting that these individuals who perpetrated these horrific crimes, or Hitler himself, or Dahmer, or Bundy, or anybody else, escapes judgment. I'm not suggesting they escape judgment. Not at all. Uh, I think they will be judged. By the way, Jesus says that in verse 28, okay? Do not rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. The next verse, are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father, and even the very hairs of your head are all numbered? God can destroy you. He loves you. What? What? I can destroy your body and soul in hell, but I have all the hairs of your head numbered because you're, I'm so fond of you. I'm sorry. That is like a drunken father, I love you, I love you, comes in the next night drunk and I'll beat the crap out of you. And then the kid's sitting in the corner when dad comes home and doesn't know whether to run up and hug him or run and hide from him. I don't know whether to hug this God or hide from this God. If this God is threatening me one minute, then he'll destroy me in hell. And the next minute he's going, I love you like I love the birds. Come on, class. Come on. It's right there in your scripture. It's right here, right in front of us. So, I do believe those individuals will suffer judgment. I don't know how long that judgment will last. I have no idea. Ages, maybe. But I do believe God's consuming fire will continue to work until he has burned everything out of all of us who will... Um, by the way, here's the difference between God's consuming fire. God is a consuming fire, the Bible says. If God's consuming fire is his love, I'm going to ask you something. How many of you in here are happy you, you want God's love? So you're not afraid of God's consuming fire because you know it's lovingly going to purify you. But if you don't want it, God's consuming fire is a pain. I also shared with you this. That part of judgment, I believe, is the idea of empathy, reaping what we sow. I've shared with you before the picture of a courtroom scene where individuals who've been victims of crimes have an opportunity to speak to those who perpetrated the crimes. You've ever seen it? And it can get really powerful and raw and emotional. The person, sometimes people cry when they're listening, other times they're stoic. What if part of the judgment of Hitler is he has to listen to how he destroyed so many lives? And what if his soul and his, what I mean by his soul, his goals and his purposes and his desires in life are melting away? And he begins to have empathy for those that he has hurt. And all of a sudden, Hitler and those individuals who perpetrated crimes with him no longer exist. It's been burnt out of them. They no longer exist. By the way, in heaven we get a new name. I'm thankful because I'm tired of the name Fred. I just got to be honest with you. <laughs> I'd kind of like a new one. But 
do you understand what I'm saying? So when you see him, you're going to go, I don't want to be in, he in heaven with Hitler. You won't. You won't. You won't be in heaven with John Dahmer either or Ted Bundy. All of that will be completely burned away. And that individual will return to the image that God made them. Our story class begins in Genesis 1, not in Genesis 3. The evangelical church in America and around the world has told us that our story begins in Genesis 3 with the fall. It doesn't. It begins in Genesis 1 with the blessings of a heavenly father who said, I've created you in, in my image. Are we all doing good? By the way, another thought with this one. Do we believe Satan deceives us? Do we believe that Satan deceives minds? Do you believe that Satan could have deceived individuals? The Bible says that those, Satan has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. Satan has blinded their minds. So I've, I've told you this before. So here's the scenario. God creates an angelic being more powerful than we are who has the ability to deceive us and once he deceives us God then punishes us forever for believing a lie that God created an angel to deceive us powerful enough to deceive us not in order to deceive us did, it, did that make sense I'm going to try it again <laughs> alright let's do it again here we go so God creates an angel powerful enough more powerful than I he's powerful enough to deceive me he blinds my mind so that I don't believe. Then when I die, God judges me for not believing, even though he created a being that was more powerful than me, that caused me not to believe, yet I still get punished forever in hell. So, so we at least have to ask, the. I'm, I'm at least saying, ask the question. All right? So Satan is deceiving people all the time. And who's to say? Most Christians don't like this. I think this is a legitimate statement, and I'll say it for myself, even though you may not be willing to say this. That's fine. I don't know what I would have been like if I had been raised in Hitler's home, in Hitler's environment, with all the lies he was taught as a kid and everything he grew up to be. Maybe I would have turned out just like him if it weren't for the grace of God. Because let me tell you something about your free will. You ready something about your free will? None of you chose to be born in America. None of you chose your parents. None of you chose any of that. But a lot of people want credit for their decisions. And the things that were given to them by God, they had nothing to do with. Nothing. Yet they're like, well, I chose this. Well, thank God you were born here instead of Iran in a home of a radical family that wants to destroy. Listen, you didn't choose all of this. Right? Now, we're responsible for decisions, and that's a whole other thing. We will get there, I promise. But I want to ask you this question. Does God love Hitler as much as he loves anybody else? Does God love all of those individuals who were participating with him as much as he loves you and me? Did Christ, when he died on the cross, does his forgiveness include Hitler and those who did those? And is it possible that at some point in the ages to come, all of those individuals will have repented sincerely and placed their trust in Jesus? Is it possible? So that, and we'll look at this verse maybe in a moment, but you guys are going so slow tonight. <laughs> that as 1 Corinthians 15 says, and God will be all in all. Did you know that that says that, 1 Corinthians 15? God will be all in all. Have you read it? We'll see it here in a moment. What does it mean? Well, God's going to be all in all. All right. Thank you for the question, and thank you for allowing us to have the discussion, because I think this was a really good discussion, don't you? Did you enjoy that discussion a little bit? So before I move on, and I apologize for this at home, but it's hard to run microphones everywhere, but regarding that kind of subject, which was pretty heavy, any further questions real quick? N no.
uh, by the way, just check this, Pastor John, they, Tim, those working here. Trevor, you're, he's never be a part of our media <laughs> and uh, outreach program. Great gifts. We'll use you many other places, but never in uh, uh, marketing. You're out. Okay. Why does it keep coming back to this? Uh, this has come up many times. Yes. And can everything I just said be said of Satan as well as Hitler? So now, when I get to that subject in the future, I will give you a couple of reasons why that may not be the case. Okay? But we'll get there. I believe in it. I I believe in it. Okay, the nature and duration is different. So they they would be, my question then in that regard, uh, Alicia, would be why isn't it mentioned in the Old Testament? Why aren't they preaching it? That's not the place to look, though. Here's the question. If anybody wants a dare and a challenge, look at the book of Acts. When the apostles go out to preach after the resurrection of Jesus and tell me how many times in the sermon they are talking about hell. Just look it up. The difference, yeah, Terry, the difference between what I'm suggesting and maybe a Catholic version of purgatory is that I'm not suggesting, for, there might be a similarity in the teaching, but oftentimes purgatory is where you are made ready for salvation. So it's part of your salvation. What I'm suggesting is our salvation rests in Jesus Christ alone, his finished work on the cross. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Purgatory has nothing to do with us uh, and our destiny with Jesus. Jesus accomplished all of that on the cross. So that's the difference what judgment is going to look like in the next stage we don't know he just didn't say i don't know i do think paul suggested in first corinthians 3 that we will all pass through the fire wood hay and stubble burnt up gold silver precious stone makes it mark 9 49 everyone will be tested with fire jesus said everyone by the way can i suggest that you're being tested with fire now Wow, I got some amen. <laughs> I didn't have to convince you of that one, did I? But I also think that that fire is the love of God. You say, wait a minute. How is all this evil the love of God? When individuals reject him and walk away, God gives individuals what they desire. I believe that's the wrath of God. And people bring hell to themselves. And they might carry it on in the age to come as well. Because what God is doing is saying this. Here's what I love about my father. You ready? I love about our father. What I love about our father is, is that he's bound and determined that you and I will be what he created us to be. You're not going to ruin it. I'm not going to ruin it. Nobody's going to ruin it. He will accomplish his goal. I just think he will do it through non-coercion, non-force, but like a persistent loving parent, he will keep coming. And that fight, by the way, you can run from him. It's just not going to go well for you, prodigal son. The prodigal son lived in hell, a hell of his own making. By the way, the older brother lived in hell also. Why are we just going on and on about all these other things and we're not getting our lesson done? But do, does it make sense to you? 
So just some thoughts. By the way, we're on a journey. This is a journey of learning step by step. We're not going to grasp all of this overnight. Let's take the journey together. You know what? Who's to say that five years from now we're not meeting talking about the same kind of things? We'll just keep growing in it. Are you okay with that? As long as we're becoming more loving, I'm okay with it. And I'm serious. If Fred is regressing in his behavior, his fruit, the Bible, Jesus told us how to determine whether things are working or not. By their fruit, you'll know them. It's not their doctrinal statement. It's not the building they have or how many people show up to worship in that building. It's the fruit. That's how you'll know. Jack. It, it's a combination. Matter of fact, if you, if you or if anybody wants to read the four views of help uh, uh, published by Zondervan, a, a well-named publishes the NIV, there is a version of the salvation uh, by a gentleman by the name of Jerry Walls, and he writes a view that includes some of this together. So purgatory is some punishment, but it purifies you for salvation. So there's a part of it that's required for salvation. I just think salvation rests in Jesus alone. All right? Let's do a little scripture. By the way, I'm going to... did. Uh, did we hand out the handouts with scripture verses on them? Did you get some scripture verses? Good, good. I, I didn't put them all on there. There's probably only like 70. There's only 70, and I, I expect you have them memorized by next week. All right, that's it. Just memorize them. Uh, you say, what are those verses? Those are verses that can be interpreted this teaching that I'm sharing with you this way. So individuals that say, well, it's not in the Bible. Really? Really? Keep it in your Say, look at these verses. But again, okay, this is really shocks people when I say this. It's one of the reasons I say it. The Bible doesn't say anything. It has to be interpreted. And when you share verses, you can say the Bible says, no, your interpretation of the Bible says. So we have to apply our interpretation to it. By the way, I don't know if you've noticed, but we've got over 30,000 denominations. If the Bible clearly says, then why in the world do we have 30,000 denominations? You know why? Because this is what I was told being raised. We were the only ones that were right, and the rest of them were all wrong. The independent Baptist group that I grew up in, we were right. And the reason we have all these others is because people just don't understand it like we do. That's arrogant. And one of the reasons people are walking away from the evangelical church today because they see it. It's arrogant. There are other ways to interpret this. There are other ways of looking at it. And there's, uh, and they're, they're, uh, uh, legitimate orthodox views the views that i'm sharing with you right now is the predominant view of the early church for the first 500 years jw hansen go read i forget the name of his book just read it, the early church's view on this subject if you like to be a real nerd that book's pretty thick and difficult if you like it join me at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Remember, do you remember this? Do you remember this verse we started looking at last week? Do you remember? It's like Paul's going, I want you to get it. Every knee should bow in heaven. Remember, on earth and under the earth. Remember this? Every tongue, every tongue. And so he really, by the way, memorize this statement right here. You ready? Let's memorize it together. To the glory of God the Father. Say it with me. One more time. One more time. All right. To the glory of God the Father. You're going to have to hang on to that. All right. So Paul says that. I talked to you about this last time. Do you remember this? Okay. So 
Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. What did the other verse say? Every tongue was going to confess. But they're going to confess Jesus is Lord, right? To the glory of God the Father. If you declare Jesus is Lord, believe in his heart, God's raised and dead, what will happen to you? You'll be saved. I would, we got to talk about being saved someday. For it is with your heart you believe, justify with your mouth, you profess your faith and are saved. That's what Romans 10, 9 and 10 says. So here's what we kind of concluded. If one confesses Christ's lordship, one will be saved. Everyone will confess Christ's lordship according to Philippians 2, right? right well, we just looked at it. Therefore, everyone will be saved. There's some deduction. Here's the problem. Objection. Pastor Fred, I'm objecting to my own statement. You ready? The Romans passage stipulates two conditions. Remember? Confession and belief, while the Philippians passage affirms only one confession. All right? So, here's the objection. I kind of jumped ahead there, sorry. So they are suggesting the objection suggests confession without belief right so what the objection is is that Romans 10 says if you confess with your mouth and you believe you'll be saved Philippians says everybody's going to confess but it doesn't say they're going to believe therefore Philippians isn't saying everybody's going to be saved so what they're suggesting is is that the Philippians passage is suggesting that they're going to confess Jesus is Lord without believing Jesus is Lord what is the statement I asked you to remember? Do it again. It's catching on. To the glory of God the Father. So you're, I'm, we're supposed to believe people are going to confess Jesus is Lord even though they don't believe it, and God's glorified by that. Right? God's glorified. Because it says in Philippians, Paul said, to the glory of God the Father. Yet they're saying, but wait a minute, they're confessing, but they're not really believing. And so God's going to be glorified if people confess even though they don't believe. So, here's what they will say. The confession in Philippians is forced. That's what I was taught. My preacher stood up and he would say about Hitler, Hitler will bow on his bony knee and confess Jesus is Lord. Madeline Murray O'Hare, so they got to be older to remember that name. She will bow on her knees and confess Jesus is Lord. Pound the pulpit. And whoever was bad at that, the Beatles, the devil's music that I have downloaded on my phone right now they will bow on their bony knees and confess Jesus has anybody ever heard a message like this am I the only one I used to hear this a lot and they're always on their bony knees never their fat tender cushy knees it's always their bony knees alright and the confession the idea is that the confession is they're forced to confess it even though they really don't want to the word confess comes from the Greek word, that Greek word right there. <laughs> that very Greek word right there. Exomologio. <laughs> yeah, that's wrong, isn't it? We all know that was horribly done. Do you know what this word means? It's used in other places in the Bible, and it, it describes a willful and joyful expression. A willful Every tongue will willfully and joyfully confess Jesus is Lord. You could, according to some Greek scholars, Martin Vincent one in particular, you could add the phrase, he says you could add the phrase with thanksgiving to it. It would fit. They will confess Jesus is Lord with thanksgiving, knowing that the second they get done, he's going to throw them into hell and burn them forever. So, Romans 14, 11. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord. Say it with me. Every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will exo, molo, geo, so, so. 
whatever that word was, will confess God. What does that mean? Joyfully and willfully with thanksgiving and with praise confess him. That's what it's saying. Class, that's what it's saying. That is what it's saying. So, the objection is, nope, that's not what it's saying. The, they will bow, but they're not going to want to bow. It's forced. They're forced to confess Jesus as Lord, and they're sad that they didn't accept him while they had the chance. So, let me ask this question. Are you ready? Put on our thinking caps. So, God doesn't force us to confess Jesus as Lord while we are alive. That would bring us salvation. He waits until we die. Then he forces us to confess Jesus as Lord. But then it's too late. Let's do it again. For those who say that, the, that that verse, when you pull that verse out and you speak to somebody and you're talking to them about this verse, they're going to tell you that doesn't include that, that, that that's forced. And now you can pull the Greek word out and it means everything. But you could also ask this question. You could say, so then, if I understand you correctly, God doesn't force us to worship him while he's alive and confess Jesus as the Lord while he's alive, that would bring salvation to us. He waits until we die, then forces us to confess Jesus as Lord, and then it's too late. Did, did that one come across clear? Because I know sometimes when these things, it takes a little bit. So do you understand what I'm saying? Are we supposed to believe that? I mean, wouldn't that be what they're saying? Isn't that exactly what's being said? Yeah, God's going to force you, but it's going to be too late. He could have forced me while I was alive, and that would have brought salvation. That seems like a really compassionate thing to do, if he's going to do it anyway. But then again, if you think God wants to burn people forever in hell, then you've got to let him do it that way. By the way, did you know that God hates impure motives for worship? He hates it. He despises worship that isn't real, sincere. He doesn't want it. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. Well, I thought you were the one that told us to do it. That's a whole other subject. When you come to appear before me, who asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Who asked you to carry your animals in here with your cold, hard hearts and slit their throats and think I want all this blood offered to me and you don't really care about me? What makes you think I want that? Wow. Hello? So this God who says, I don't want your phony worship, well, and if he forces us to bow and confess Jesus as Lord, he kind of wants a, force, a, a phony confession. By the way, this is just an opinion of mine now. It wasn't for a long part of my ministry because I just followed the rule. I followed what I was told. But I will tell you this. I think the forced confession idea pictures God as a narcissistic dictator. You will worship me. I saw pictures of ISIS doing that to people. I'm just being honest. Shock value, I'm sorry. I saw ISIS forcing people to worship him. My God's like that? I don't think so. And then the, uh, the, here's the next objection to this idea. Oh, by the way, oh, stop bringing me meaningless offerings, he says. Paul quotes Isaiah 45, 22 and 23. Did you know that? Did you know Paul was quoting the Old Testament, Isaiah? Turn to me and be saved. Say that with me. Turn to me and be saved. By the way, is this forced or is this an invitation? Okay, this is an invitation. Turn to me and be saved. Who? A select few of you are all the ends of the earth. All. 
So I want everybody to turn to me. It's an invitation. For I am God and there is no other. Amen? It's an invitation. He's calling us right now. (laughs) And then he said this. By myself I have sworn, my mouth has uttered in all integrity because that's what God does. That's how God operates in integrity, not forced stuff. A word that will not be revoked. What word is that? Stay with me. Before me, every knee will bow. By me, every tongue will swear. So, that's what Paul was quoting. By the way, what did Paul add to that? To the glory of God the Father. He added that. Every tongue, every knee will bow heaven on earth and under the earth you know what Paul was saying to the people in his day you know what they heard when they heard all of that everybody it's the only way you could at that day Paul's like I want you to understand so Paul oh this is too much fun I'm, I'm having fun okay you ready I, I'll sit back down friend. okay I want you to get this Paul takes the Bible and added to it. He took the Old Testament understanding and said, there's more to it. And he took it and he said, here's what the Bible is saying. Well, I thought if you interpret the Bible literally, you're only supposed to interpret it according to what the authors intended at that time. Class, can I tell you something? What the authors intended is very much a part of interpretation. But all you have to do is read the, old, uh, the New Testament. Jesus comes along and said, this is what they said. But here, let me tell you what's God's meaning. And he took it to a whole other level. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians. He said, you know that rock that, that the water came out? That was Christ. No, it wasn't. Moses didn't say it was Christ. That rock wasn't Christ. That was a stinking rock. Do you mean, do you honestly mean to tell me that you think Moses knew at that time when he said this is the rock, he, that rock, he was thinking about Jesus Christ? He wasn't. What did Paul do? He took the scripture and he said, we have more revelation. And he took it and he said, here's how to understand this. Because there's a trajectory. This book. So that's why everybody goes to the Old Testament and they go, well, that's what it says. God said, if you see a woman and you've, you've went in and you've captured the town, you've killed all the men, you see some women, you kind of think, oh, that one's hot. Take her for your wife, try her out for a month. If she doesn't fit, cut her fingernails and toenails and send her on her way. Thus saith the Lord. It's in your Bible. I showed it to you. You mean to tell me we really think thus saith the Lord? That's like rape, folks. This is, this is, come on, come on, come on, come on. You say, then why, I, listen, we explained all that, why it's happening, but I just want you to know, there is a trajectory in the Bible. That's why you can make a case for slavery from the New Testament. And they did. In America. While some was using the Bible to say, no, we can't, others were using the Bible to saying, yes, we should. So how do we figure it out? Simple. What would Jesus say? Because the, the Bible bows to Jesus. And I'm telling you something. Jesus wouldn't treat people that way. That's why Paul wrote a whole book called Philemon or Philemon. And he has a whole different outlook toward the slave Onesimus who ran away from Philemon. Philemon, however you pronounce it. Do you follow me? The trajectory of Scripture. It's exciting, folks. But when we have this idea that certain things have to happen, then we are forced to say, no, God, yeah, God did that. No, God, yeah, God obviously did that. He he had to do that because there's a certain way you have to interpret it, and if you don't, it's a slippery slope. And remember, that slippery slope goes both ways. How y'all doing? 
I'm just telling you, this kind of thing is, I'm just alive with truth about who God really is, and I wish I could just shout it for the world to hear, but I'm going to tell you something. God will do the work. It will do it in his time. I just think a reformation is happening, and I hope that I'm alive to see it really take root. Tim? Second Corinthians 12. Maybe, maybe, very possibly. What I find intriguing is this. Think about that. The question I would ask is, why doesn't he get to say? I've asked this question before. Why did Paul get knocked off his donkey onto his donkey? Why did that happen? And why does he get this great revelation of who Jesus is? How fair is that to the people growing up in certain places of the world where they don't even have a church to go to? And Paul gets this vision, and Jesus says, here I am. Why does he get that? Yet my Bible tells me God shows no favoritism. You see, God, I, this is something God showed me just a few weeks ago, and I know I'm being more bold in making that statement. I used to never make that statement. And I, again, I'm human, so I could definitely be wrong, but I honestly believe God showed me this. Every eye shall see him, referring to Jesus, and we will be like him. First John somewhere. How many of you know? We shall behold him. Sandy Patty used to sing that. We shall behold him. Beautiful song, by the way, and she was a lovely singer. Okay, so, by the way, also got a divorce, was kicked out of the Christian circle of singing, and almost wanted to take her own life because of the lack of grace in the church that named Jesus Christ. There we go. Oh, back to my story. Every eye shall see him. You know what I think that's saying? I don't think, Tim, that's saying every physical eye will see him. I think God was saying everything's going to be taken away and every spiritual eye will be able to see him maybe like Paul saw him. And when we do, we'll want to be like him because we'll be like him. Because once you see him, you want to be like him. You know what you're going to want? You're going to go. You're, you're going to run a run to Target and get the Jesus costume because you're going to go. I want to be like him. That's what you're going to do, and that's what we need to be sharing with our world, so that the world will want to be like him. I can't go any further tonight. We've got a room for a couple more questions. We only got through. By the way, I, I, I will promise you this. Here's where we're going. Here's where we're going. I know I'm. We're going slowly and probably need to speed up. I hope it's okay. I hope you're like, no, I just enjoy you going off the cuff. <laughs> um, I'm trying to give you some verses so that when somebody attacks and says this is not biblical, I'm trying to lay a fr framework for you that, yes, it is. Now, we will look at all the very t the toughest of toughest passages, the lake of fire passage in Revelation. We'll look at it. Um, we, we will look at uh, Matthew 25, 46, some into eternal life, some into eternal punishment. We will look at the rich man and Lazarus. What's that about? That's pretty strong. I mean, if you're an eternal conscious torment person, that's a strong, that's, that's in your, you're like, ooh, that one sounds like me. So how, how does somebody, how do we interpret that then? We will get there. I also promised you this, and I would like to do it soon. There is a documentary movie produced by Kevin Miller that was sent throughout the theaters across America back in, I don't know what year it was, about the time Rob Bell came out with his book, Love Wins. If you were in church world, that one was kaboom. Okay, 
He has a documentary called Hellbound. So I just want you to know, AMC Theaters carried it. That's how well done it is. It's not... Am I going to get myself in trouble here? Okay, I won't. What's that? Okay, so you will... What you do, we're going to come in here and for like three or four weeks we're going to watch it together. That's what we'll do. We'll put it up here on the big screens. And we're going to watch Hellbound the movie. And, it, and when it, we'll, we'll watch it for like 30, 40 minutes, and then we'll stop. We'll take some questions and feedback from it, and then we'll do that. We're going to do that in a couple of weeks. Okay? Then pray about something else. I'm going to be soon sending invitations to several individuals. George Saris, uh, the author of uh, Heaven's Door is Open, Why Are You Think? Paul Young, author of The Shack, we're going to be sending, I'm going to ask them to give me, uh, a gentleman named Richard Murray is down in Dalton, Georgia, who is a brilliant attorney, who write, is a theologian as well, on the side. He writes more stuff than I've ever seen in my life, and he's a full-time attorney. Um, I'm going to see if we can at least interview them, maybe possibly live, sometimes on Wednesday night. And we'll just hear these individuals that have wrote, and you'll, you'll hear from other tremendous thinkers, people who love Jesus with all their heart and they love the church and so sometimes you feel like well there's nobody out there that believes this yes there is matter of fact it's kind of sweet so I hope we can accomplish that no promises um, so any other question comment before we go uh, Andy Stanley is a wise individual where uh, he doesn't tip his hand exactly I, ad I admire him for what he did in Unhitch Yourself from the Old Testament, Irresistible. Is that called Irresistible, his book? I think it's on my reading recommended list. Yeah, it's outstanding. And, and, and he, because he's such a large figure with a great following, he got cremated for that. I mean, literally torn apart. I, I can't, I just don't know what to say, folks. I'm just telling you, Christians eat each other up I mean brutally uh, claiming that he should be taken out that he should be removed that he, he's a danger a heretic he has to be stopped he came to Kansas and our, our staff went to hear him as he was discussing this book and they were taking questions and I sent him a question he didn't answer because he was saying it's all the resurrection and he said he makes this statement if Somebody comes and promises they'll die and rise again, and they do, I'll follow them. Well, I used to think that, but I don't any longer, because I said this. It's the cross that makes the resurrection more beautiful. Because in the cross, we see who he really is. The resurrection reveals his power. The cross reveals his power over death. The cross reveals his power of forgiveness, his power of love, his power of self-sacrifice. Because if a figure like Hitler claimed that he could die and come back to life and did it, I wouldn't, still wouldn't want to follow him. So that's what I wrote and asked him that day, and he, he did not answer. Because I think he's wise and doesn't get into that controversial kind of stuff that I find quite enjoyable <laughs> at times. Okay, anybody else? Anything else? You good? Had your enough tonight? Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you. We are two-year-olds trying to understand physics. And we just need your guidance. It is so much bigger than we can comprehend and understand. But what we do know is you revealed yourself in Jesus. And what we're trying to do is just fit together the example of Jesus with the scriptures that we are so thankful you have given us. Give us this wisdom as we continue along this journey and this journey of making us more in love with you, which will in turn make us more in love with our neighbor. Dismiss us in that love, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everybody. We're off next Wednesday.